I'd invite you this morning to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10, and we are continuing our look at this great chapter, which details for us the Good Shepherd. Who is he? What is he like? What did he come to do? You remember that John chapter 10 is a commentary by Jesus in front of the religious leadership in his day of what he had just accomplished in John chapter 9. John chapter 9, Jesus healed a man who had been born blind. And if you've put yourself in the blind man's shoes, you, you have imagined what it would be like never to see. To have been born in a condition where you did not have physical sight. And then to meet Jesus and be given physical sight for the first time. And what follows that miraculous event, an event that no man had ever heard of before that time... is he saw Jesus and believed in him as Lord and was summarily excommunicated from Jewish society, from culture, from the external religion of his day. Not only de-synagogued, but de-cultured, potentially de -familied. His parents were afraid even to tell the truth of what happened to him. And yet this man embraced Christ, in fact, John 9, 38 tells us he worshiped him. Something reserved only for one who is deity. And Jesus is explaining what he did in John 9 to the religious leaders in John 10, who ushered a precious sheep out of the sheepfold. They had no business with a man who couldn't give them anything. He was needy and helpless. He was a blind beggar on the street. And, and while they should have cared for his soul, they neglected him. And when he claimed fealty, loyalty to Messiah, they shunned him, removed him, excoriated him. And so Jesus confronts the religious leaders at their failure as shepherds. And at their own spiritual blindness. What we see here in John 10, 16 to 18, our text for this morning, is the astounding claims that Jesus makes as the good shepherd. Two claims, particularly, about his mission and his authority. Jesus shocked the religious establishment with these two claims. That is what this passage is about. We know that it's a shock because in verse 19, after Jesus says these words, a division occurred among the Jews because of the words, and they said, he has a demon and he is insane. And then some said, yeah, but he healed a man born blind. And we'll come to that response and the, the mixed reaction to Jesus' words next week, Lord willing. But for this morning, let's look at verses 16 to 18 and these astounding claims of the good shepherd. Jesus said, I have other sheep which are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me. But I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. These shocking statements come from the one who just healed a man born blind. The miracle can't be discredited. But these claims are shocking and will therefore be maligned by those who hear them. These words are simultaneously hope for us and an indictment of an empty religious system. And the first claim that Jesus makes here in verse 16 is that his mission was beyond them. It was far and away different than their mission. Jesus was doing something different than the religious leadership was doing. Jesus' scope and love and leadership and care and shepherding was way beyond what they were capable of. It was not on their radar. It was not anything that they desired. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and he came for much more. 
and the bankrupt religious leadership had nothing like this mission in their hearts. Look at verse 16. Jesus says, I have other sheep. These other sheep, who are they? These are different than what is described in chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus there said, truly, I say to you, he does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way. He is a thief and a robber. The fold of the sheep there is the nation of Israel. And we looked at that some weeks ago. The the sheep fold or the sheep pen is that structure, that organization that is the nation of Israel. And, and inside that sheep pen were, were sheep that belonged to Jesus, the true shepherd. Here, Jesus says, I have other sheep. That is sheep that belong to him that are not of the sheepfold of apostate Israel. Notice the present tense here. I have other sheep. Jesus already has them. They are his. How many there are, where they are to be found, who they are by name. Jesus knows. He knows them. They are his and and he will get them. Just as he went and got the blind man in John 9. Consider as the gospel unfolded after Jesus' death and burial and resurrection and the birth of the church in Acts 2 and, and the expansion into Gentile territories Acts 13.48 says this, When the Gentiles heard the good news, they, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. There were those who had been appointed unto eternal life, and when they heard the good news, they believed. This is what Jesus is expressing here. I have sheep. I have other sheep, not of this fold, and I will bring them. We see the same phenomenon in Acts 18, 9 and 10. The Lord said to Paul concerning the city of Corinth, don't be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. Why did God have to tell Paul not to be afraid, but to have boldness and to keep speaking? Because he was afraid and he wasn't speaking. He was up against serious opposition. And God says, for I am with you. And this is Jesus speaking here in Matthew 18. And no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. That is people who hadn't believed yet. They hadn't heard the gospel and rejoiced. And yet they are his. And Jesus tells Paul, I have people in that city and I will get them. How would Jesus go about getting his sheep from Corinth? Through the apostle Paul's bold preaching. What Jesus says here, I have other sheep and they're not of this fold. This is a prophecy and a promise from Jesus to carry out his mission of salvation to the nations. Turn one page to the right and look with me at John eleven fifty two. Here is a prophecy given supernaturally by God to Caiaphas, a man serving as high priest. And he describes this. Jesus was going to die for the nation. Verse 52. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. Here's a prophetic utterance before Jesus went to the cross that his death would bring Gentiles in as well. Different than Jews. And they are scattered abroad. In fact, the scattering of the Gentiles is really scattered. They are in many folds. They are in many nations. They are in many religions. Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, 20 highlights this fact. Jesus prayed not just for the disciples, but for all who would believe through the testimony of the disciples. Jesus there in John 17, in the upper room, while he's praying to the Father, expressing inter-Trinitarian relationship and the plan and purpose of what Messiah came to do, prayed for believers down to this day from all the nations. They would believe through the testimony of those who were gathered there. This reflects the heart of God. In the blessings God detailed all the way back in Genesis 12 at the birth of a nation. Uh, When God is making promises to Abram, to Abraham in Genesis 12, he promised a people, a land, and a blessing. A blessing that would go to the nations. 
the nations beyond this fledgling little people God was going to give birth to called Israel. God was going to bless the nations through them. Listen to Isaiah 2 verse 3. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. Isaiah 56 verse 8 makes this prediction. The Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, yet others I will gather to them to those already gathered. All of this is reflected in Jesus' promise here in John 10. I have other sheep, not of this fold. And notice what he says, I must bring them, verse 16. I must bring them also. Listen, Jesus is the one doing the great commission. The great commission of of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus here in John 10 says, he is the one doing this very thing. He must bring them. How will he bring them? Through the agency of his disciples, his disciple-making disciples, his disciple-making disciple-making disciples, unto the end of the age, and he would be with them in it. This is Jesus' work, and, and he works through the agency of his followers, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the Great Commission is Jesus' work that he is doing. And he does it through his people. Acts 1 8, the spread of the good news of Jesus from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. This is Jesus' mission. Jesus' mission is in keeping with the great promises of God throughout the Old Testament, that God would do exactly this thing. And now Jesus, the great shepherd, has come. He has come to rescue the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and his mission goes way beyond that. This gives courage to the missionary. Jesus will get his sheep. He says, I must bring them. And notice what he says next in verse 16. They will hear my voice. They will hear my voice. There's no uncertainty here in the chain of events. There's no contingency given. Jesus will seek them out. He will bring them in. He will speak. And his sheep will hear his voice. That is, they will follow him. They will submit under his shepherding care. They will obey him. They will be his sheep. By the way, how do you know if you're one of Jesus' sheep? You hear his voice. You heed his voice. You hear the voice of your savior in his word and you listen and you come and you follow him. Jesus says additionally in verse 16, they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. This is an amazing statement. Jesus says here, they will be unified with Jews who believe. These other sheep, not of the fold of apostate Israel, they will hear my voice. I will bring them in and I must bring them in and they will be unified together. And there's a play on words here. It's hard to see in the English. They will be one flock. There will be one shepherd. And the words look nearly identical to each other. This word flock is really important. Notice that it's different than the word fold earlier in verse 16. If you happen to be reading an older English translation, the, the same word is used twice. Verse 16, Jesus would say, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them in. They'll hear my voice. They'll become one fold under one shepherd. That is not a good English translation, even though most older English translations followed that pattern. It has created much confusion A fold is a sheep pen. And you remember back in verse 1 of chapter 10, the sheep pen was this nation of Israel. That is, it was the visible, organized location where sheep were kept. And and remember the picture there in early part of John 10. This is a picture of a community sheepfold, a community pen. And the shepherd would walk in through the door and call his own sheep. His own sheep would hear his voice. They would follow him out. And the other sheep that were not his, that belonged to other shepherds, they would remain. The fold was apostate Israel, the nation. And the nation contained God's sheep, but it also contained people who were not God's sheep. 
The flock, however, is this unified body of followers of the true shepherd. And and interchangeably throughout John 10, the, the word sheep or flock is used singularly or plurally. It's used with singular and plural verbs sort of back and forth. Sometimes this flock is seen as one unit faithfully following the one true shepherd. And other times they're seen as individual sheep with an individual personal relationship to the shepherd. And both are true. But what is invariably true of the flock is this is a unified group of sheep that belong to the one true shepherd. It's not a mixed audience like the nation of Israel was. To go from fold to flock here in verse 16 is a significant moment in redemptive history. You see, the nation of Israel was a mixed group. There was belief and unbelief. They were all united under Mosaic law. They were all contained in the boundaries, the geographical boundaries of the land of Israel. And it was all centralized in the temple in Jerusalem. Their unity was ethnic, national, cultural, religious, externally religious, but not spiritual. That was a fold. But a remnant that is spiritual Israel, spiritual Israel are are those Israelites who had spiritual life. That remnant within Israel was a subset of national Israel. And that was the flock. Those were God's sheep. And now the flock will be very visibly, very obviously populated by Jew and Gentile. They will be together as one flock, one spiritual entity, and they will be under one shepherd. And they are significantly not called a fold. That's important. Because this body of believers, of sheep that follow the one true shepherd, will not be a mixed body of people in an external organism. And and you go, there's belief and unbelief in there. Who is it? No, this flock will be comprised of those who truly are his sheep. organization called the church would not be God's people and other people mixed in. Now we get that confused sometimes because we think of a church as a building or a a state religious organization like the church of England or the church of Scotland. Sometimes we think of a denomination. And of course there are people who are Jesus sheep in those buildings or those entities and people who are not their sheep. But what does Jesus refer to as his flock Those for whom he laid down his life, those whom he sought, those who heard and obeyed his voice, those who are joined together under the one true shepherd. That is the true definition of the church. Historically, medieval theology built an entire theology on this word fold, mistranslated in John 10, 16. The the medieval Catholic church, looking at John 10, 16, both in Latin translations and then eventually in, in the older English Bibles, they maintained that this idea of a centralized organization in Rome and one visible fold that contained the sheep, but was not uh, universally equated with God's sheep, that they were the sheepfold. Interestingly, William Tyndale's English translation prior to the King James got this right and differentiated between fold and flock. And our modern English Bibles do a better job of that too. But this radical change that Jesus is bringing about is evidenced here in this important change of words in John 10, 16. God's sheep are brought out of the mixed group of some who are God's sheep and some who are not in the apostate nation of Israel. And other sheep from the Gentile nations are brought together with them under Jesus, the true shepherd. And they are made one flock. Spiritual life defines the belonging, not ethnicity, not culture, not diet, not geography or language or religious ceremony. Not a centralized kingdom or a temple. But local visible gatherings of Jesus' sheep, Jew and Gentile together. And these individual local assemblies of believers scattered all over the earth. This is new. This is different. Turn to Ephesians chapter two for a moment. Because Jesus is saying all of these things before the church is born. But before this new entity emerges. 
If we fast forward a little bit, we get to see the Apostle Paul's description of this new entity, this new organism, the body of Christ or the flock of Christ. Paul details this in Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Messiah, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Messiah Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man." thus establishing peace. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you Gentiles are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Messiah Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. Paul details there what a privilege it is to be a Gentile and to be loved by Israel's Messiah and to be sought out by the one true shepherd of the sheep and brought in. You remember the picture in Romans 11 of the ingrafting of branches. Us Gentiles, wild, uncultivated, scraggly olives grown not in the olive garden. Cut off from where we were and grafted into the rich root of the olive tree those great promises made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And we get to participate in the spiritual blessings that God promised to Israel as foreigners, outsiders, now made insiders. What an amazing privilege. And I know 2000 years has removed from us the ability to appreciate what it meant to be outsiders brought in. But that is what we are. We who are Gentiles sought out by the shepherd of Israel and brought into the rich spiritual blessings of what it means to know him. So that now in the church, Galatians 3.28, Paul says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, nor neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And that doesn't erase the, the ethnic distinctions any more than it erases the gender distinctions or the occupational distinctions in this verse. But it does mean that Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free, are on all equal spiritual footing before the Lord. All brought in. Paul will later go on to give specific instructions to slave and free and Jew and Gentile and male and female. There are still real significant differences between those. But in terms of knowing Christ, in terms of direct access to God through the true shepherd, and in terms of being on a a playing field with one another built on love, we all get to be together in the body of Christ. He goes on in Colossians 3.11. We have a renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Jesus Christ came to the earth and did something new to make for us one, to make out of us one new man, Jew and Gentile together in one body. That was unheard of in the Old Testament. And it is new in the church. Jesus is predicting, promising in John 10, that he would bring about this very thing. Think about how challenging this new entity was. The tension between Jew-Gentile, the ethnic tension, the cultural differences, 
the animosity was very real. And it is the backdrop of the New Testament. Think about how much ink is spilled intentionally by God to address Jew-Gentile relationships in the New Testament. Perhaps we've lost sight of ethnic hostility in the pages of the New Testament. This was a real challenge. The Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 was devoted to the topic of, wait, 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 wait. the good news of Messiah, of Israel's Messiah is going into Gentile worlds? What are we going to do with that? They eat different. They live different. This creates a tension. We're hearing the Gentiles are getting saved, we here in Jerusalem, and we're a little bit offended by that. We don't know what they're going to do. Certainly, they're going to live like us, right? They're going to eat like us, dress like us. A counsel is given to the reality that the door is wide open to Gentiles, and they're not under Mosaic law. Table fellowship was at stake. The the dietary restrictions and kosher kitchens and all of these things are threatened if Gentiles get in and we're supposed to eat together. What's that going to look like? You remember the Judaizers, some saved and and perhaps uh, confused, others not saved. And they, they hounded Paul everywhere he went and they were making demands that Gentiles who believed in the gospel had to start keeping Mosaic law. They were threatened by the changes. You remember how difficult it was for Peter to eat a pork chop or to hang out with Cornelius in Acts 10. God had to send him the vision multiple times. You remember the challenge to the synagogues out there in the outer territories in, in Gentile country where Jews had gathered regularly for the hearing of God's word. And Paul would go to the Jew first and then the Gentile. He would go to the synagogues and Gentile territories and preach Messiah. Even as the apostle of the Gentiles, he went to the Jews, his countrymen. His heart broke for them. And many times Paul would go into a place and preach Jesus as Messiah. And they'd listen and they'd listen. This is intriguing until Paul would say, and the Gentiles. And they'd get offended, murderously so, and run him out of town. Sometimes beating him and leaving him for dead. This was offensive. The ethnic hostility was real. Listen, this was hard for the disciples during Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, They saw Jesus' stomach turn and his heart break out of compassion for the masses. And Jesus fed the 4,000 in Gentile territory. And they didn't understand it. They didn't know why Jesus would be talking to a Samaritan woman, a half-breed, outcast. (laughs) Why are you talking to her? The Syrophoenician woman said, can I just have crumbs from the table? The disciples did not understand the heart of Christ. Jesus' compassion for Gentile suffering under the effects of sin, that his mission as Messiah would extend to the nations. And yet the great shepherd of the sheep came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and he came to lay down his life for sheep from every tongue and tribe and nation and people on the earth. He promised he would get them, bring them to himself, and unite them together in one flock. How offensive John 10, 16 would have been to the Pharisees as Jesus stood there explaining why he had the authority to walk in and get his own sheep from out of their jaws. He walked into their sheep pen and walked out with one of his own. And he is now explaining to them what he did and what he is doing. This explanation would have been an indictment of the bad and false shepherds of Israel They failed at Israel's mission fundamentally. Genesis 12 talks about the blessing that would come through Israel to the nations. Well, they didn't take up the charge of being a blessing to the nations. You remember Solomon's great prayer in 1 Kings 8 at the dedication of the temple. And he actually prayed that people from every surrounding nation would look in on Israel and their uniqueness and how they are loved by the one true God. And, and they'll pray to this house and, and they will look to you as the true God. That was the best expression of Israel and her mission in the Old Testament. A longing that other nations would look in on their unique relationship to the one true God and want to know the God of Israel. And you have trickles of Gentiles in the Old Testament. 
you, you, you have Ethiopians coming up and, and rejoicing in Solomon's wisdom. You have those who have attached themselves to Israel as God-fearers from the surrounding nations. You have Naaman the leper cleansed. You have Nineveh repent en masse in a generation at the preaching of Jonah who did not want them to hear the good news. And then you have God-fearers around Israel at the time Messiah came. You have people that have chosen to get close to Israel. Because of the God of Israel. And God in his grace is breaking out in salvation to those who have attached themselves. What should the religious leaders of Israel been doing all along? Proclaiming the name of Yahweh. Keeping Mosaic law so as to be set apart, different and distinct. So the world would say, why do you eat that food? Why do you dress that way? Why do you plow your fields that way? At every turn, they would say, we're unique. We belong to Yahweh. We stand out and that's okay. Come, know our God. Rejoice in his word with us. That's what they should have said. They failed at their fundamental mission so much that in Romans 2.24, Paul Paul tells them that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of their hypocrisies. And there he's quoting Jeremiah chapter 9 to indict them. Of course, Paul knew he was one of the Pharisees before Jesus changed his life. They were supposed to lead the nation to be a a peculiar people with a purpose. And instead, they used God's people to line their pockets and secure their positions of power. They were bankrupt morally. They did not lead people to God. And when they made disciples of themselves, they made men who were twice a son of hell. They were vacuous in their leadership. They had position, but they did not impart life. They made empty promises, and they oppressed the vulnerable and the downtrodden. Jesus came in John 9 to lead one of his precious precious sheep out from them. And here in John 10, he is explaining his mission. This mission, of course, is a messianic claim on the lips of Jesus. Jesus here is fulfilling what the Old Testament said Messiah would do. This is also a claim of deity. We'll see that in greater detail at the end of John 10. But this is a remarkable claim. And his claim is not only that his mission went far beyond the hypocritical religious establishment, but secondly, that his authority was far above them. His mission was way beyond them, and his authority is far above them. Look down at verse 17. Jesus says, For this reason the Father loves me, Because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. The for this reason points to what comes afterwards. Jesus begins by saying, the father loves me and here's why. Jesus' authority is grounded in the approval of the father. Jesus is claiming here his status as beloved son. And you get these heavenly pronouncements. This is my beloved son, Matthew 17 in the great transfigure at the transfiguration at Jesus baptism and at the crucifixion. You have these pronouncements that this unique one is none other than the son of God. And he is loved by God. The the father loves him. Jesus is expressing here his unity of purpose with the father and the approval by the father of his work. This is the father's endorsement of his mission. Think for a moment, Christian, about your love for others. Why do you love others? Why do you love your brother or sister in Christ? Your love for others is grounded in your love for God. Your love for others horizontally is a demonstration, a manifestation that you actually love God from the heart. If you hate your brother, you prove that you don't actually love God. But your love for God is grounded in something outside of you. Your love for God is grounded in God's love for you. We love him because what? He first loved us. And you must know, Christian, that God's love for you is grounded in God's love for God. It is grounded in the love of God, which is pent up in his very being, which finds his expression in inner Trinitarian affection and love, love between the father and the son, the son and the father, the love of the Holy Spirit for the other members of the Trinity. It is the love of the triune Godhead expressed in love for you that produces your love for him and then results in your love for one another. 
This foundation of love is what Jesus is putting on display here in John 10, 17. Intertrinitarian love has produced the rescue mission of the good shepherd. This is proven, Jesus says, by his willingness to lay down his life to purchase a people for God's own possession. When Jesus says, the father loves me because I lay down my life, he is not here earning the father's love by dying. That's not what he's saying. He's demonstrating his messianic credential, his identity as God's own son, as deity in the flesh. He's demonstrating his right to walk into the sheepfold of Judaism to get his sheep and lead them out. Furthermore, he's proving his right to join those sheep to his other sheep, to Gentiles of all people, and to unite them as one flock under his care. The father loves him because he is carrying out the unity and purpose of the inner Trinitarian plan from the foundation of the world. Jesus is proving that his relationship to the father is one grounded in love and fundamental approval of what he is doing. The Pharisees held to the empty claim that they were the ones most loved by God. They were the ones most approved by God. They were the gatekeepers of God's approval in their own minds. If, if anybody's loved by God, we'll tell you whether or not you're loved by God. You follow our rules and then we'll tell you whether or not God loves you. They saw themselves as the gatekeeper. They neither loved God nor loved people. They were not loved by God in the way that the son is asserting his special relationship to the father right here. This again is an indictment of the leadership while it is an assertion of Jesus' own deity. By Jesus asserting his sonship to the father, he is claiming a unique relationship. He is claiming special access and perfect cohesion with God's plan for the world. And he is stepping on every toe of the fraudulent religious establishment. He's asserting his authority to be the shepherd of God's people. This authority next is revealed in power over death and life. Look at verse 17. For this reason, the father loves me. What is that reason? I lay down my life so that I may take it again. And it's interesting how these two are put together in a statement of purpose. Jesus dies so that he can rise, according to verse 17. The resurrection is the purpose of his death, according to this verse. There is a union between his death and resurrection. Resurrection is not Jesus' answer to being killed, like a counterpunch in a boxing match. Oh, you got me, but watch this, I'm going to rise from the dead. No, Jesus died so that he could rise. All of this is under his control. His death and resurrection go together in the rescue plan over which he is sovereign. He died so that he could rise again. And an earthly shepherd tending sheep who died trying to save his sheep, that kind of a shepherd would be brave, self-sacrificial, but ultimately unsuccessful. If a Middle Eastern shepherd got eaten by a bear, he was the appetizer. And the flock of sheep he was supposed to protect are then the main course. Without the shepherd, the sheep would be vulnerable. Jesus shepherds death for his sheep is different. He rescued his sheep by dying for them because he has authority over death and life for himself and for his sheep. Notice verse 18 Jesus' authority here is unassailable. No one else has the authority that he has. He says, no one has taken my life from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. Uh, Literally there, I lay it down of myself. This is from him. Jesus is not a hapless victim. Think about the events surrounding the death of Christ. Judas' betrayal. An insider close to him, knows where he's going to be, follows his every move, is secretly stealing money from the money box, and he can get 30 more pieces of silver if he just hands them over to the authorities. Jesus said he was the son of perdition, selected by Jesus to carry out this plan. This was Jesus' plan, not Judas' plan. 
Think about the Roman soldiers when they came to arrest Jesus in John 18, 6. Jesus utters two words in the original and they all fall down. They can't stand before Jesus simply saying, I am. The Roman soldiers aren't in charge. Caiaphas isn't in charge. Turn back again to uh, John 11. And we read a portion of Caiaphas's prophecy. He prophesied as high priest. We want to back up and look at this a little more. We want to think about uh, Caiaphas prophesying supernaturally, given a direct revelation from the Lord. And notice what happens. Verse 49 Caiaphas was high priest that year, and he said to the, to the leaders, uh, the leaders were upset that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. They thought, we need to put a stop to Jesus, and we should probably off Lazarus to bury the evidence. Uh, everybody's going to follow Jesus if they keep believing. They, they couldn't deny the miracle, a miracle which had power over death. You would think, we want to be on his team. No, they wanted to preserve their position And one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Verse 51 explains, He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. And then notice verse 53. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him. You see what's going on here? God utters a direct revelation through Caiaphas, who is at the office of high priest. And like Balaam's donkey, he just has to say what God told him to say. And that's it. And he says it. Jesus is going to die for the nation, not just the nation, but for God's people scattered abroad. Gentiles too. How did Caiaphas, who had to utter the prophecy accurately then go about communicating to the the consortium of religious leaders who wanted to kill Jesus and make a plan. The way he took it was, yeah, Jesus needs to die for the nation. The nation can survive if we just get rid of this guy. And they came up with a plot to kill Jesus. He couldn't do any other than utter God's clear prophetic word. And then what did he as an unbelieving priest do with those clear words set out to murder Jesus. I just think that's really ironic. Jesus is in control. God said, Jesus is going to die for the nation and for Gentiles too. Caiaphas takes that word and says, yeah, let's kill him. Really remarkable. That means all the plots, all the conniving, all the sham trials that would follow We're all Jesus doing, ultimately. Jesus escaped from them time and time again because it was not yet his time. He eluded their grasp. The Jews didn't want him to be murdered during the festival, but Jesus was in charge of the timetable. Herod and Pilate, uh, Jesus went before them, John 19, 11, and told Pilate, you have no authority except it be given you from heaven. Consider the insults and the And the mockeries made by soldiers and passersby, all of those were predicted. They were all fulfilled because Jesus is accomplishing his plan. Listen to Matthew 27. You can turn there or you can listen along. In Matthew 27, we have this audacious scene where you just almost tremble to read it. How? I mean, if they they only knew with whom they were dealing, it... Oh, what are they going to think when they stand before the glorified Christ and remember this scene? Matthew 27, 27. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium. They gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him. They put a scarlet robe on him. After twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him. They took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off, put his own garments back on, and led him away to crucify him. They were mocking him. And the mockery they decided on was to mock him as a king. 
No king could be stripped and beaten by Roman soldiers. But you think you're a king? Okay, we'll put a robe on you. We'll, we'll put a crown on your head and, and we'll give you a phony little scepter and we'll pretend to pay homage. How audacious. And you just tremble for those soldiers at what they would face when they met the king again in glory. And the irony in all of that is Jesus was the king. Even the mockery of him proclaims that he is king. Think about John 19. What is the superscription placed over him on the cross? King of the Jews. How did the religious leaders respond to that? Many of the Jews, John 19, 20, uh, they said, don't write king of the Jews, but write up there that he said he was king of the Jews. Do you remember Pilate's answer? What I have written, I've written. And so in the providence of God and the sovereign hand of God and the sovereign orchestration of Jesus, the king, what inscription goes over the top of his head as he's crucified? King. He is king. He was unique in his birth, unique in his life, unique in his death. John 19.30 tells us he gave up his spirit. Nobody does that. Nobody died like this. Nobody took Jesus' life. Jesus is in fact so totally in charge that in all of the beatings, in all the physical sufferings of crucifixion, he prays for his enemies He ushers a criminal into eternal life and he delivers his own earthly mother into the care of his disciple. In Matthew 27, 54, the centurion who oversaw his death, who likely oversaw hundreds of crucifixions, if not thousands of them, declared, this truly is the son of God. J. Vernon McGee put it very simply, Jesus was never more kingly than when he went to the cross. This authority was possessed by Jesus. Notice John 10, 18. I have authority. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. Jesus had the authority to rise again. Romans 6, 4 tells us the glory of the father raised him. Romans 8, 11 tells us the Holy Spirit raised Jesus. But John 10 says Jesus raised Jesus from the dead. Who raised Jesus from the dead? Yes, the triune Godhead working together in all of the work of the Messiah and particularly in the demonstration of unity and purpose and power in the resurrection. Here in John 10, Jesus said, I will raise myself from the dead. And this expresses not just ability, not just the power to do it, but the authority, the express authority to do it, which demands ability. But it was not merely a statement that he can conquer death, but he has the right to conquer death. He must and he will conquer death. Jesus said in John 2, 19, destroy this temple and in three days, I'll raise it again. He was speaking about his own body. That is, Jesus had the express authority to disintegrate his inner man from his outer man. To decouple his spirit from his body like the decoupling of freight train cars. Jesus had the authority to raise and glorify his physical body and to recouple that resurrected physicality to his spirit and to live forever as the God man, the one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ will forever be attached to a physical body in glory, a body he received at Bethlehem and raised from the dead personally and glorified. The next chapter in John's account, John 11, will demonstrate that authority. There, Jesus will say, I am the resurrection and I am the life. If you believe in me, you'll never die. And if you believe in me, dying, you'll live forever. And then he raised his friend Lazarus from physical death to prove his power and authority. And all of this comes, he says, from the command of the Father. Notice the last clause in verse 18. This commandment I received from my Father. If Jesus hadn't yet caused the Pharisees to go berserk, this last statement would put them over the edge. 
The command of God, higher than the authority of the Pharisees. God's approval, his love, his endorsement was all Jesus needed. He did not need their approval. He did not need them as the self-styled gatekeepers of Israel to tell him what to do. He was sent. He was commissioned by his father, his father whom the religious leaders did not know. Jesus is saying here, I have this command from my father. You are so out of step with God You don't know him. I am in league with him. I am in communion with him. I am in love with him in purpose and in power. Jesus claims his unique relationship and all he does is in line with the father. He is simultaneously declaring his sovereignty and his submission to the father's will. And this is an offensive claim. Not only does he tell the religious leaders that he has a special relationship to God, the son of God, and he's beloved, but also that he was doing everything as a matter of obedience to the explicit command of God. They could make no such claim. The religious leaders were self-appointed frauds who pretended spirituality, took advantage of God's people in order to preserve prestige and position and power. Listen, if you're here this morning and you don't yet know Jesus Christ personally, Listen to what the shepherd of the sheep has done. He can rescue a blind beggar out of bad religion. He can save a woman beset with years of physical suffering that excluded her from the life of the culture and the religion of her day. He can set free the demon possessed. He can change greedy swindlers like Matthew and Zacchaeus. He can radically alter a murderous Pharisee like Paul. The shepherd of the sheep comes for the unlikely, the forgotten, the lowly, and the desperate, and also the prosperous, the proud, and self-absorbed. Jesus rescued prostitutes and physicians, a Samaritan woman, a Syrophoenician woman, lowlifes and the high-minded, outcasts and downcasts, the oppressed, and some oppressors. This is a small sampling from the opening chapters of Jesus' mission, his mission which continues to this day. And in church history, many, many more of every sort, every class, every kind of sin have heard the voice of the shepherd and have been brought to him and made part of his flock. To our missionaries, take heart. Wayman, training pastors on multiple continents, Jesus has his sheep and he will bring them in. And your labors are worth while. Jesus has his sheep in the mountains of Papua New Guinea. Jesus has his sheep in Italy. To all of us disciples here this morning, you have heard the voice of the great shepherd of the sheep. You have heeded his call. You have followed him and there's no one like him. Don't be distracted. Keep your eyes on him. We are a part of what Jesus promised right here in John 10. Other sheep. That's us. And Jesus is still getting other sheep through the Great Commission, through us disciples as we go, as we go making disciples, teaching them to observe all that our shepherd commanded as Ryan Mitchell taught us last week. Your workplace, your soccer team, your home, Jesus is getting his sheep. And he's using you to accomplish that great work so that one day people from every nation and tongue and tribe on the earth will be made glad in the salvation of our God. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we pray that the nations would be glad and sing for joy. There is a day coming when when you will judge the peoples with uprightness and you will guide the nations on the earth. You will shepherd the nations. You will rule with your staff and your rod. All the world will see you truly as king. And those who have known you as shepherd will be glad. Oh, Lord Jesus, would you be pleased to get your sheep, to bring them to yourself, that they might know what we know who know you, how sweet it is to be under your shepherding care. We ask that all the nations would be glad, even at the same things. In your name, amen.